Welcome to Electric Evolution with Liz Allen. This podcast is about the journey to a more sustainable future in order for us to be able to do our bit to achieve net zero. I'll be discussing a variety of topics with experts in their field in order to educate and increase our knowledge of clean energy, electric vehicles and the electric vehicle infrastructure. So whether you're an individual wanting to make a difference at home, a small business or a corporate, this podcast is just for you. On today's podcast episode, I have got Chris Rimmer, who is the Deputy Head of Department at Senex. Chris, thank you ever so much for joining me. We've we've not met, but we've spoken on Teams before, haven't we? So, so lovely yeah. to see you again. Wow, thanks for having me. Uh, pleasure to be here to chat. So, Senex start off with and what and you know what let's let's start i want to start off with you rather than senex because there's there's a lot to talk about with senex anyway isn't there so you have previously worked in energy and and obviously you've been um I'm not, i can't remember how long you've been at senex now how long is it um it's about four years nearly coming up so been a little while um and yeah previously i worked over at eon um, and kind of a bit of a background in energy and between then and now I actually took a break out to help set up a theology college so something completely different project management project director and then sort of came back into energy and uh, electric vehicles afterwards so what okay god you've got to tell me about this theology college flipping egg what what how did how did how did you get into that how did well, you go from eon to uh, setting up a theology college yeah, well, long story. I'll try and keep it a bit short. Go on, but, um, go on. I guess, so yeah, was at Eon really delighted to, to be on their graduate programme. Um, it's a great thing that we sort of try and bring a bit of here. There's a lot of us that used to work at Eon here at Senex. Um, they gave me lots of different experience, helped train me up in kind of project management, got to do R&D projects. I oversaw um, a call centre team as well, um, international experience as well as UK. So it was a really good time and got right into kind of connected home, autonomous um, heating and lighting and uh, how you use data around the home to make good decisions to help people and businesses save money. Um, and I'm also kind of at the same time personal life member of my local church and mm -hmm. um, one of the pastors there uh, was a lecturer, like a faculty member, mm -hmm. a, a kind of... Um, Theology College and they said well we need a project director we need someone to sort of bring this all together so I got a tap on the shoulder say well do you fancy doing something a bit different and so I was kind of employee number one almost um, in trying to put this thing together that was almost like distance learning so you can imagine people that want to train to be church ministers or church leaders mm -hmm. you don't want to take them out of their community and put them in university for three years you really want to train them on the job because it's pastoral it's about people it's about putting stuff into practice so yeah. I did that for two years or so and then handed that over and then um, got back in touch with some of my old Eon colleagues and they said well you know we've got a, a position open here at Senex do you want to come and start get stuck into decarbonizing transport and so got lots to learn still but yeah getting back into the topic and um, really interested to be in our energy systems and infrastructure department. Amazing amazing so please can you do me a favor and tell everybody what Senex actually does is there yeah, a, is, so it, is, does it, it must stand for something for a start off. It does. And I'm so glad that it's a shorter version of the Centre of Excellence for Low Carbon and Fuel Cell Technology. So, you know, you can't put that on the business card. So it, <laughs> it's Senex. Um, we're an independent, not for profit research and technology organisation. So our mission's about helping transport of all forms get decarbonised. Uh, we're divided into different groups. So I've got my transport colleagues, they deal with everything that moves. So lorries and lawn mowers, um, tractors, um, freight, ferries, kind of if it's moving cool. around, they monitor it, understand it, try and get their heads around the technology. And then I'm over in the infrastructure and energy systems um, department. So here it's about the recharging, refueling, um, yeah, trying to do that without blowing up the local substation, trying to figure out the right number and type and placement of infrastructure to enable that. And of course, we work very closely together. I mean, we were set up well, 18 years ago, actually by the UK government and the automotive industry. So yeah. that's before EV was kind of a hot topic or anything like that. <laughs> the idea was to bring these new ideas and technologies down the research and development pipeline and over the sort of valley of death into commercialization. And that's what my colleagues who've been here since it was set up have been doing. So it's a real privilege to work with folks who've been at this for a very long time. And now, you know, climate change is a hot topic. Air quality is quite an important mm. topic. 
um, and we're seeing the switch particularly for lighter vehicles and lots of really interesting trials going on. So it's great to sort of trade off their knowledge and their experience when they were pushing water uphill. We're now at this more sort of tipping point and it's quite interesting to see everything growing pace. So yeah, we're, we're independent, we're constitutionally non-profit, so that just means we've not got shareholders to, to, to please or to pay, and so that means we can figure out the right things to go at. Sometimes the questions that no one else wants to tackle and try and um, bring some of our sort of expertise and analysis to bear on it. And you've had, and you've just said, you've had people there since the start startup. Are they still there now? Yeah, I mean, so we have a, a good turnover of folks. So it's always nice when we get new folks in. They bring new ideas, they bring new mm -hmm. energy, they come from other industries, be that public or private. But yeah, we have folks, in, including our CEO, Robert, who um, yeah, have been here really since day one and have been kind of waving the flag for cleaner, greener transport for a long time. And um, it's, yeah, as I say, it's a real privilege to work with people like that who definitely know their stuff. Yeah, that's amazing. That's and for, to go the um, it, like you said pushing water uphill. That must have been a really, really, diff, really difficult one. It's not you're not selling it, but difficult one to support when people weren't even on on board. You know, at least at least you, we've got a portion of the UK that's on. <laughs> well, probably more than a portion. But I, I, there's a lot of people that recognise the requirement for decarbonisation, isn't there? But I think we just need to we need to do a lot a lot more currently to kind of push that push that agenda because I know it's part of a it's part of a bigger picture, isn't it? But it's just really important. Yeah, I mean, I find it's a it's a really interesting area to work in, and actually, um, the fact that there are still questions means that I still have a job in some <laughs> regards. So you know, it's it's quite a complicated technical area if I think about the stuff that I really work on day in, day out, electric vehicle infrastructure, EVI. You know, there's a lot of kind of technical electrical compliance, legal regulatory stuff mm. in there. So, you know, the fact that I get to to watch what's going on, see best practice, try and repackage it up as advice or training or sort of guidance or strategies um, to hopefully help people make sensible decisions and routes through that, whether they're public sector, local authorities who are looking at local EV infrastructure or private uh, organisations who are looking to enter the market or enhance their offering. We work with charities as well um, who are looking at kind of destination sites where people are driving saying, well, yeah, I want to charge at XYZ site or even whole countries. Yeah, it makes for a very varied and interesting job that I'm kind of delighted to do really. Yeah, that's, I didn't, yeah, I suppose thinking about it, it must be something that that you know every every day is different for you so i'm assuming one day you could be working with the government next time next day you could be working with private industry or, or or a local authority how does it how does it all fit together who are the ones that you work with the most then or is it kind of like such a big spread yeah so i sort of say if you look at the long term we've got kind of four c's we work with councils companies charities and countries Mm. nicely alliterative. Um, I think in terms of my team around electric vehicle infrastructure, particularly at the moment, there's a big emphasis with the public sector in the UK here. Um, so I'm, I'm sure we'll go on to talk about the local EV infrastructure fund, Levi, um, but looking to try and assist local authorities and central government with their schemes sort of management to get charge points out, yeah, the right type of charge point in the right number, in the right place, under the right commercial arrangement, and do that in a way that is appropriately future-proof but gets good value for money right now you know that like you say there's kind of a, a, a wide variety of questions that need to be answered there we do of course still work for some of those other organizations and you know, it sort of ebbs and flows depending on um, who's interested in working with us and, and who's putting out for work the other side of, uh, of things that perhaps I do less but my colleagues do as well is research and development so often yeah, delighted to be partnering with or funded by Innovate UK and others to try out brand new um, ideas or, or to try and build on ideas. So vehicle to grid is something that our department has a long history in. I think we installed the first domestic vehicle to grid charger at one of my colleagues' houses. Now the first one on a meeting room wall, I'm sure, because it's over there in our other meeting room, having not worked after a couple of years, it sort of um, gave up the ghost. But you know, from then on, kind of trying to track with that idea, dynamic charging. Um, we're currently just wrapping up a project that we've been working on there, use of sensors and data, trying to get into heavier vehicles, 
this week while we're filming. I guess after this gets released, we've got the Senex LCV event, um, where I think our stand is based around sort of farm of the future. So what do you do with decarbonisation in a in an agricultural setting? Mm. So yeah, you know, these sorts of customers and these sorts of projects come along mm. from time to time, which are big chances for us to try and dive into um, topics that are as yet unsolved. Well, as many things are, obviously. Try and make our little contribution to moving it down the line. Because it is it is just like a massive big jigsaw puzzle, all of this, isn't it? It's, it's putting all these different pieces together and making sure they all work. So, you know, that's that's a big task in itself, isn't it? Absolutely. And, and I guess, um, particularly because we come at it from a, a sort of technology perspective, <clears throat> making sure that the products, the solutions, the services, the underlying tech, you know, is it fit for purpose? Is it reliable? Does it deliver? But then, of course, you've got to have the customer angle, like in terms of the end user, is it meeting their needs? Is it making their life more convenient or more mm. clean or more mm. cost effective? And mm. then, of course, there's a commercial angle as well, you know, right back to our beginning being set up by the automotive industry and the government. You know, how can we make these things fly? It's not going to be us that sell them. You know, there are folks out there doing the hard yards of getting the solution to market, making businesses out of it. Um, so you've kind of got to get that tech, customer and commercial triangle sorted. And of course, yeah, that means that there's there's lots to be considered in there. Mm, definitely. Do you know what? I'm just behind you. And for those who are actually listening to this rather than watching, I'm sorry, this won't make any sense to you, but I will tell you. So behind you've got kind of like a, a it's sort of like a map or a mind map anyway, isn't it? And you've got, I can see you've got, yeah, product development partnerships, regional strategies and policy. I can't see the bottom one, but you've got innovative infrastructure, energy systems, vehicle to grid. There's lots and lots of stuff that you're getting your teeth into there. So where, um, how, how are you actually, I know your, yours is obviously the, the transportation side. Who in government are you working with then on the transportation side? I mean, like I say, I know I've just explained some, some of the stuff you've got behind you, but if we go back to transportation, who would that be that you're working with? Yeah, so we do a lot of work with OZEV and really delighted to, to kind of partner with them on, on a range of projects. Um, obviously, they report into Department for Transport mm. um, and, um, you know, there's DESNAS as well around energy security and net zero um, and then funding across those, you know, comes out in various ways or is steered in various ways through Innovate, mm. um, uh, but actually increasingly internationally. So the UK is not always a leader in everything, but actually, you know, has a number of things where there's there's a, a weight and a, a length of experience that can be um, exported and applied. So working with Department for Trade and, and, and International Development, working for um, other folks who are trying to sort of put UK companies out there or who are trying to attract inward investment. So there's there's a range of government departments that we ultimately work for. I guess for my team, it's particularly um, the team over at OZEV at the moment, like I say, it sort of comes in, you know, in, in phases. Uh, but yeah, it's it's great because it means that we are getting a bit of a front row seat on some of the policy developments going on um, and, and helping to try and um, support what is happening. Um, so we're part of the support body for the Levi Fund at the moment mm. uh, and, and really trying to um, assist with the execution of that scheme so that there's you know, ultimately an improvement in the commerciality of electric vehicle infrastructure. That's that kind of commercial point we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. but also getting the sort of scale, value for the public purse, serving residents and businesses who, who don't have off street or sort of private de depot parking, which comes back to the kind of wider strategies and policies that, that we have in transport, which roll up to the sort of wider policies and strategies we have around net zero as a country. So you know, in that sense, you're know, playing our little part amongst the whole range of folks that are that are contributing there but your your own contribution for that is 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 quite um in depth isn't it so so if we if we look at levi for example your you've been working with ozev haven't you on the technical specification for levi so so for those, there will be lots of people that know about this, but for those that don't, can you just explain about Levi and how, how it works for local authorities and, and, and what this, this technical specification is actually about? 
Yeah, so um, Levi, as we said, is the local EV infrastructure fund. Um, it's uh, about four hundred million pounds set aside for local authorities to spend. There's sort of two pots. The capability fund is fifty million pounds, which is really enabling the hiring of resource mm -hmm. in local authorities. Mm -hmm. So as, as those have sort of created the scheme, they were very aware that there is just often a lack of capacity and capability in the local authorities. You know, they've got. Um, uh, sort of statutory uh, obligations on schooling and health and social services. Yeah, it's a lot that local authorities have to oh, deal with. Um, and so, you know, EV charging can get sidelined or it can be sort of the side part of a job in a wider climate change or a wider highways sort of department. So here, the funding is to enable the hiring of local EVI or EV officers um, who ultimately will be kind of playing a coordinating strategy delivery um, sort of role. And then the other part, the sort of 350 million ish, um, is really capital funding to help um, support uh, commercial at scale deployment of charge points, particularly for residents who um, don't have off street parking. And, and Levi sort of complements the rapid charging fund, which some of your listeners or, or viewers might have come across, which is about equipping the motorway service stations and, and, and the sort of the, the main roads of the UK. So Levi works, each local authority has an allocation of money um, and then they need to put together an application process to show how they're going to use that um, and then that as it becomes approved then uh, triggers the release of the money which can then be put together with private sector investment hopefully to make sure that we're getting as much scale as we can um, to reduce barriers to EV uptake. Um, and so we're part of the support body so our job is to advise the local authorities on making good plans and good strategies and then on good project formulation, ultimately getting um, a good application and then assessing that application and sort of passing that up to OZEV for them to, to review and hopefully approve and then um, sort of tracking with the delivery of that. And you can imagine that spans the whole sort of project development process. So you're right the way through from, you know, what even is an EV? Um, which for some uh, officers and folks who are new to this area is, is a very legitimate and important question, yes. all the way through to monitoring and evaluation. You know, we've done it, we've got it out there, the contract is there, how do we manage it, how do we make sure um, that we're doing the right thing? And, and right in the middle is the question of procurement. Um, and historically, local authorities have been sort of trialling and testing with, with more of a fully owned and operated model where they, they kind of do everything. So they take all the risk, they get any, any reward themselves, but it allows them to control their projects much more as we're seeing EV uptake increase, there's investment in the private charge point operators. They're able to bring sort of supplier funding to the table. Mm -hmm. Now the kind of commercial arrangement shifts more to say concessionary arrangements or um, to land leasing where sort of the LA releases the land or even to joint ventures. We see one or two joint ventures where public and private sector are coming together. So then the question is how can we do that as well as we can? So part of our role along with colleagues in Energy Saving Trust and PA is to produce a series of products or, or documents and guidance, um, for want of a better term, um, mm -hmm. that is to try and um, uh, bring or, or move us towards more consistent ways of doing that. And so you reference these technical schedules, mm -hmm. you've got uh, mm -hmm. sort of um, heads of terms for concession contracts which say these are the key terms we'd expect to see in a concession contract. Here are the options for what you might consider along the way and here's what we think best practice looks like in terms of um, contract length or in terms of who owns the assets or in terms of how you might manage or influence the tariff. And of course many of those hinge on the question of technicalities and compliance and regulations and so we've got a sort of secondary piece of guidance that hopefully will come out um, very, very soon, which uh, we call the technical schedules, which goes through a sort of smorgasbord menu of choice. So if you want to put out there a bit of a, uh, it's not as tasty as a smorgasbord, let's be honest. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> cutting through the dry content and the excellent work that, that my colleagues have done, you know, something around safety, around data, or around what is a seven kilowatt standard charge point or mm. any of these points that you were, might build into a specification it allows mm. a bit of picking and choosing to build a specification. And our, our hope with that is to bring a bit of consistency. So really conscious that the private market is going to be out there bidding for stuff. So having the same terminology in the same forms, going out to market in the same way, reduces the overall effort for, for those that want to bring their investment to bear on these projects, but equally it upskills and supports the local authorities, hopefully to procure good quality 
um, high value contracts. Um, so we're sort of trying to balance those two off. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, like I say, it's kind of putting that stuff out there, um, refining it as we go and we learn. You know, we don't know everything. We've, we've taken feedback from lots of CPOs and lots of LAs as well. And sort of interested to see them get used in anger and then find out where we've perhaps not quite got it right or where we're landing in the right place. And, and refine and improve over the next couple of years. Mm, mm. I was, I was going to say, right, so on a concession, we're talking about, so I, when I think of a concession, it's concession, I think of kind of John, the John Lewis of this, you know where you kind of go into John Lewis and you've got lots of little shops, but that's, that's not what we're talking here, is it? We're talking about the, the money that comes from the local authority and the money that, that the actual charge point operator is, is putting in, is putting in for, you know, for the local authority. What I was going to ask you, you've got to tell me whether I'm right about that, by the way, but what I was going to ask you was, how can charge point operators afford to pay all of this? Because it's, it's, it's quite risky at the moment, isn't it? If you, if, if you think about it, you know, at the moment we've got, what is it, 17% of, of cars on the road are electric. Um, so, so it's kind of, there's a there's a lot of there must be a lot of hedging going on with this yeah so i think it's 17 percent of sales are electric at the moment um, yes that was it yeah yeah, about yeah two and a half percent last time i checked of, of cars um but yeah you, you, the number's absolutely spot on there um yeah so i guess the way to think of the concession is almost like the right to offer a service mm. so in the case of in john lewis uh, i'm going to reveal my lack of fashion sense here uh, you know like dorothy perkins has a right to sell with it i don't know it, i like i'm just saying it myself i'm sure um but uh, all the people out there listening here are much cooler and down with fashion than me they're probably like, going to tell me off actually people listening and watching because i'm probably thinking De debenhams would have been a better, okay, a better um, option yeah. but that's totally gone now isn't it so. um, yeah i mean yeah anyway moving on past that um so yeah it's the kind of it's the right to operate and so um what what you know kind of i guess you come back to the question of why is the la even involved in this right why doesn't the private sector yeah. do this themselves yeah. and, and there's a couple of reasons and it will vary by la depending on where particularly the, the cabinet will land on this and what political affiliation it has and the kind of overall strategy and funding of the la but broadly speaking local authorities have land and they oversee the highways so they will need to be involved one way or another yeah. and they could just go here's a car park we're going to lease it out get a ground rent and what you do with it is fine and, you know, that's fine but if there's a certain level of service you wish to impose on that you can't do that in a lease so that's where the concession comes in so it's, look you can yes. have access to the land and a right to offer a service but here are the stipulations you need to follow uh, and of course then there is a sharing of risk as you point out here so you know the private investor is saying right well i'm going to put my x hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds in and I am expecting a certain utilization in the future, which will gain me revenue, which I use to make my return on investment. And so the key thing in the concession here is making sure there's a reasonable return on investment for the private yeah. sector. But crucially, they do need to have the risk of operation is on them. And that's part of really the specific definition of what a concession is. It can't just be the risk is kind of taken out of the game by the local authority yeah. investment. There needs to be a sharing of risk. And, and that might divide down in different ways for different mm. projects. But broadly speaking, it's a kind of public-private commercial partnerships so are coming together to work on providing something. And, and the LAs will want that because um, for many, there's a sense that um, this wave of electrification is coming. But for folks who don't have driveways, for folks who can't afford, um, to buy new or even used vehicles um, for people who are very dependent on their private cars. You know, this isn't necessarily an easy market to get into, no. certainly not at the moment. Um, and so in, in the sense of kind of equity and fairness and balance, a so-called just transition, then there's a need to make sure we steer these in the right way to support particularly the areas where there's not maybe the strongest commercially viable case um, and leave other use cases, you know, sort of, service stations or, or, or fuel station type models where there is a much better case um, to the private sector to deliver. So that's kind of why the LA sort of needs to get involved, how they share the risk, what it is they're trying to achieve. And of course, yeah. it's not the model for everyone. You know, there are cities out there who want to own and operate absolutely everything. There are those who have this joint venture approach. So we're trying to be, you know, across those approaches and make sure that we're driving scale, commerciality, ultimately getting the right charge points as I said at the beginning in the right place yeah. with the right number on the right arrangement. Absolutely because 
like you say, if the if a if a local authority and a charge point operator has done their done their work, they will be able to see, theoretically you'd be able to see what footfall is going to go through, wouldn't you, in order to make sure that that both parties are happy, and then and then I suppose the concession or the the term terms and conditions. To me, I'd call that a service level agreement, actually, yeah. rather than yeah, just yeah. terms and conditions, because the, the well, the two go together, don't they? The ser the service level agreement is actually right. Okay, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? But you know, if it's the if it's the LA, to, the local authority to the charge point operator, we need you to be to make sure that this is. I mean, especially with the mandate that's that's come out for kind mm. of you know kind of the higher powered um, charges, you know, we need to make sure that you are ninety nine percent reliable and that you can prove prove that with data and because and the other thing is if you I suppose if you've got a council car park it's got the council on the on the you know on the board at the front of it is a user actually going to ring the, the charge point operator up or are they going to bad mouth the council well and this is all part of what we're trying to do with these schedules and the advice and the guidance is you know, give the councils Particularly those that need it, you know, there are lots of councils out there who are going great guns and, and particularly spearheaded by you know, officers who really know their stuff and doing great work. But mm. there are those who are still a little bit in catch-up mode um, and in that sense they get the capacity through the capacity funding and then we're trying to build out the capability. Mm. And we don't have all the answers but so far as we can draw on experts and others and bring that in front of them, you know, through kind of events that we run, through training that, that, that we're sort of planning on through networking channels with sort of Teams channels where you know, the LA officers are actually asking and answering their own questions. You know, you say, What's, what do you do about this? Uh, you, has anyone got a template for traffic regulation orders? Oh yeah, sure, here's mine. Oh, could I have that one too? Uh, you know, and kind yeah, of they yeah. pile in and help each other. You form a bit of a community actually where then the support body is there to provide the scaffolding and the structure and hopefully some of the knowledge. But actually there's a lot of knowledge out there and there's a lot of good stuff being doing. So, you know, kind of sharing that best practice as well. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was going to ask you, so, so obviously, Levi's been a, a bidding process, like, as, as you've said. Was the take up of Levi what Senex and you know what, was it what everybody expected? And how do you know how many local authorities haven't are, are actually left over? Do you know what I mean? Because it was only a certain number in the pilot, wasn't it? And then there's been more funding this year. Yeah. But how many are left over? Is yeah, it a lot? so um, uh, good news is none really, um, and the reason for that is so there's definite pent up demand, as we saw that in the Levi pilot. Uh, that was for some slightly more innovative projects that were trying to test the boundaries on technology or test the boundaries on okay. some of the commercials, um, and then um, OZEV was able to release additional funding for others that were originally not part of the first nine, if I remember correctly, but were able to be part of a kind of extended pilot. But then because each LA has its kind of allocation there, so I'm sat here in Charnwood in Leicestershire, so Leicestershire has some money, and that is then spread across the whole country. Through the process, it's about the LA achieving a certain level of application, at which point it triggers the release of the money. So we want really excellent applications, and that way nobody gets left behind. Uh, and we can kind of drive the commercial and the bidding out into the market to get the best charging offer we can for that money rather than having LAs compete against each other for funding pots. And so that's been a, uh, you know, quite a, a new way of delivering the funding, but it means that um, nobody's left behind because the money is there. And then it's about making sure we match the availability of that money with their ability to start to put those sort of project application proposals together. And so we've got some for this financial year and some for next financial year and some that are just you know, hoping to be this financial year. But, you know, if some things slip, we might, uh, they might move into next financial year. So come March 2025, hopefully, all being well, the money has been dispersed um, and then is with the LAs to start running these procurements, ultimately to partner with um, the, the, the private provider or providers that they select so that we can then deliver. So you know, this is a program that's going to run on for, for quite a while, I suspect. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask you, so there's a couple of questions I was just thinking. So once the procurement pro, um, process has gone through, so that they've been, they've been, say they've been awarded the money or, you know, they know that they're actually getting the money and then the procurement process goes through, how long is it before they actually have to spend, you know, to have spent it by? What period of time, you know, have they got? 
Yeah, so there's no hard and fast limit here, and I think things will be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, clearly, um, because this is about supporting um, strategy delivery and breaking down barriers in mm. advance of you know, kind of 2030, mm -hmm. uh, for the, the, the first sort of big target 2035 for all, all vehicles being, all cars and vans being sold, being zero emission. Yes. Because of that, we want to deploy the money quickly. Um, but equally, you want to do it at quality. So quality trumps time in that regard. So get the right application in so it triggers the release to the LA. And then it will be for them to figure out the right time. And of course, they're going to need to be sensitive to the market's ability to respond to those tenders, the supply chain's ability to then ultimately deploy. And so there'll be kind of installation programs and planning that, that sort of cascades off the back of this mm. and then commissioning. And then we're into operation. So I think what we should see is a real increase in expansion in the available charging capacity that's public funded, supported through Levi. Of course, in parallel, many um, charge point operators are charging ahead. Um, no pun intended, um, <laughs> trying to find their own locations <laughs> and do deals you know, at particular destinations or locations. So you know, with those two sort of twin tracks, then we should see a sort of expansion that ultimately brings comfort to um, the drivers that perhaps are out there. And, and we know there are those that are looking around like, well, maybe I'd like to switch, but is the infrastructure really there for what I need? Well, yeah. So we should start to be able to scaffold and support that. The, the amount of stuff that, I mean, me and you are both in the same WhatsApp group, aren't we? With the, There's a hundred people in this in this WhatsApp group. And uh, and there's there's a lot of negativity out there fueled by, and I've t I always talk about this in all of the podcasts or most of the podcasts, fueled by some, you know, the, the, the media push, pushing this, this kind of negative, negative agenda, as, you know, and it was even it even affected in in my mind of or actually you know around the um, the Uxbridge by election, you know the way that things moved and the backpedalling that the government started to kind of uh, start start doing. Was that did you start kind of going oh god, <laughs> it's you know d does it affect you at all that? Or, or, do you, yeah. or does it kind of like, as far as you're concerned, you know that you've got this funding and you know you're going to be helping people, you know, the local authorities and the charge point operators for X amount of time. Or did it start getting you a little bit mm, not quite sure about this? I'm not particularly happy. How did you feel? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I guess I can't speak for the high politics, the decision making that goes on and, and affects, <laughs> you know, kind of the timing of these releases. And clearly the government will have its program, it has its announcements it wants to make. And, you know, we've seen in the news this week with concrete in schools, there are some mm. really serious things that need to be addressed. And, and, and rightly, that will take up you know, priorities. We don't want concrete blocks falling on kids' heads and stuff. Did not at all, um, no. I think that said, our approach here is we, we crack on delivering, basically. Um, so, you know, we want to we want to see acceleration towards the delivery of, of the goals we think are important. You know, I think for myself personally, I come back regularly to that Public Health England report that says 36,000 people die a year from poor air quality in this country, um, and a significant proportion of that comes from road transport, from nitrous oxides, from particulate matter, you know, cardiovascular, respiratory diseases, and the like. And we have air quality management areas where the legal thresholds for some of those pollutants have been passed. Currently, our best solutions are move the vehicle somewhere else. And so with emissions that are much lower at the tailpipe for some of these vehicles, along with wider sustainable travel sort of plans to get people out cycling and walking and on the shared transport and public transport and the like, um, we can start to move the needle on some of that stuff. And so that requires really good project formulation and strategy that requires good applications. And so we crack on trying to deliver. and. Yeah, the politics will come and go and people take different views on this and um, some people get very exercised by that personally i'm like let's get stuff done let's try yes. and make it a bit of a cleaner place um and you know, do our contribution and hats off to the folks who i mean you know we're in kind of a research organization we're not really delivering in in the truest sense so it's it's the folks on the front line some of whom are our local authority officers um, who are actually just getting the job done, uh, you know. And so that's that's kind of where I, I tend to land on it. Yeah, yeah, no, I get you. Talking of poor air quality, um, my I told you about I've got a 17-year-old son and I nearly did an embarrassing mum thing today to him um, because we were, we were sat 
um i've been we're both celiac we're both eating our gluten-free lunch sat in martin and spencer's uh the, there's a little food food a car park of martin and spencer's food in reading and there was somebody idling it was 27 yeah. degrees and she was idling and she was literally sat eating a lunch and i oh my god i was chomping at the bit to go and have a word with her but my son was like no mom no you can't do that i went and i actually got out of the car and sort of leaned over you know and she was she was far enough away from me but i just thought oh my god do you actually not think about it but but people don't do they i used to think i i suppose i didn't think about it in the same way but i do now you know and it's it's actually getting that mess how do you get that message across to people about poor air, air quality unless you're actually talking about x number of people die or have you know like that li the little girl in in lewisham you know that, that died and the, and it yeah. said it on a but on a death certificate that it was poor air quality or air pollution how do you get this message across to people other than banging on someone's window and going turn your engine off well uh, maybe your son was happy that you weren't going banging on windows but uh, i think you know we it comes down to providing, I think, providing people with the choice and the opportunity and, um, you know, where, where it's appropriate, the kind of incentives to, to think about the wider impact that our behaviours have. You know, mm -hmm. it's so easy, I think about my own life, so easy just to buy something or do something. It benefits me. And it comes back, it's an old, old piece of uh, work, the, the tragedy of the commons, I don't know if you come across this, but you know, the little village around the green, and mm. everybody puts a sheep on the, on the green. So they're one sheep up, but they're one over the number of sheep down, because that's how much grass gets eaten. So you're like, well, I'll put another sheep on. So you know, everybody puts sheep on until the thing becomes overgrazed, and then mm. all the sheep die. And I guess all the people die as a result. So you know, that is kind of the picture in my head around the actions that I take which benefit me, um, ultimately, I get a lot of benefit from them. It's very easy to forget the wider um, consequences that that has on others. Yeah. Um, and so in terms of air quality, you know, I'm hopping in the car, driving place, it's really easy to forget you know, what impact that might have on other people who might simply just be living next to the road. So you know, that for me is a really, you know, I'm, I've no doubt there's ways that I could put that into practice myself better, but it's a strong motivator to turn up to work and um, you know, kind of brings a really cross-cutting, whatever the political stripe, lots of people agree, it's good for us to have clean air. And I think of an LA officer who I was in a workshop with, and they said, yeah, it's kind of unacceptable that we have this number of people die every year in our county. I'm like, well, yeah, we, we now have the technology to do something about that. Um, and so, little by little, slow by slowly, let's get that out there. Let's encourage people to travel more healthily and more sustainably. And you know, maybe some of those, whatever, at the last count, 600, air quality management areas in the UK will soon you know, start to drop down and we start to see some of those sort of benefits come through. Yeah, exactly. And you you guys were involved in, uh, there's been a letter going to government, hasn't there, about the legalisation of e-scooters. So what, joint, it was 25th of July, I'm just looking on your website now. It's a joint letter to the Prime Minister. Do you want to just explain a little bit about that? Cause thinking about clean air quality and active travel and, and just, and actually we don't want to just be having EVs on the road, do we? We want to reduce the amount of, of kind of traffic that's on the road full stop and doing different things. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I've got colleagues who've worked a lot on micromobility, on, uh, which is more than just scooters, they always tell me. Mm -hmm. And so I should repeat the answer, you know. Um, I suppose it's really simple. Is it really simple? It's really easy for someone in my place or if you're writing a kind of strategy to go, okay, let's take all the petrol diesel cars off the road and replace them with electric cars. And that causes a wider consumption issue. It doesn't really hit the congestion points. You know, congestion loses people time, it's economic yes. value. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's kind of a wider impact of that sort of thing just sat in traffic jams day in, day out, particularly when we have platforms like this, which can work very well. There's no substitute, personally, I think, to being in person. Um, but uh, there are some tasks that are very easily, um, you know, replaced by this sort of digital interaction. So, you know, thinking more widely about what we call the vehicle park and how we manage down the number of vehicles on the roads in general, you know, if we could have just perhaps half or it's maybe it's 75 percent or 90 percent of those petrol diesel vehicles replaced by electric, um, that's fewer batteries that need to be manufactured. That's 
less metal that needs to be put into things that are sat stationary like 95% of the time. Yeah. And yeah. That, that opens up an opportunity to challenge. Um, you know, we sort of say the Englishman's home is his castle. Well, maybe there's something, some similar phrase around cars, like I want my car on my drive for me to drive when I want it. Well, do I need to own that car? Could I share it with others? Does it need to be on my drive? What, ha what can it be doing when I'm not using it? Um, how can we start to open up other ways of thinking about getting around? And of course, sort of personalized mobility, shared mobility, micro mobility, uh, you know, are, are key topics. And yeah. the good old e-scooter is a little bit a casualty, as I understand it. Uh, my transport colleagues will shoot me if I get this wrong, but of you know, the kind of classification system, it, it, you know, unless you have an MOT and insurance and all these other things that cars have, it's technically illegal on the roads and on pavements, you can drive it on private land. Of course, there's a profligate market um, in places where they are being illegally ridden, and even in the pilot areas, um, you know, the sort of the Londons and the, and the Nottings of this world, um, there's sort of the interesting ways of getting around, and pe they're quite popular. So, it's one of those examples where the innovation has happened, and now something needs to happen to really catch up to enable this because people love them and they find them very convenient. But we need to find ways to steer that so it's kind of you know a scooter barreling down a pavement at 15 miles an hour that runs into oh. people it's a pretty yeah. dangerous thing but yeah. on the road there are subject to hgvs and we've had deaths and the like sadly so you know kind of putting the right structure around that to put it in its right place and to release that innovation but within the right boundaries makes a lot of sense and that's one less car that's driving so it's a little bit more space on the road so you know a little bit more less stuff manufactured or whatever or whatever so you know it's kind of comes back to that question of sustainable travel that we talked about earlier and getting if you like the transport hierarchy right in terms of how we should try and move people and goods around um, and so yeah hence we've been involved in all sorts of things in fact at the upcoming Levi Roadshow we've got colleagues from Como UK kicking off with what's wanted from local EV infrastructure well you know it's about kind of mobility and car clubs and this sort of thing so mm -hmm. trying to think laterally as well as you know what do we need to do for the EVs that, that we foresee coming on the roads. Nice no, brilliant actually and, and these these road shows you're having lots of local authorities attending anyway and, and kind of giving them giving them a, a, a lot of a lot of value. I just want to f I finish off by asking you what do you want what would you like to see the UK to have what, what would you like the UK to have achieved by 2030? Oh, that's a good question, Liz. <laughs> um, well, I think if I think about just my area of work, there are lots of things I'd love to see achieved. You know, <laughs> we could talk about poverty and hunger. We could talk about yeah, um, all sorts of societal issues, um, the human condition. Not you know, we could really go wide with it. But let's talk about transport, since that's really what we're on about here. Um, I think what, what I'd really like to see is um, an equality of opportunity for people to make a different transport choice. It doesn't necessarily need to be car to car. Um, and for that to start to filter through into um, reductions in pollution and environmental impact. And yeah, I was just reading today um, a study showing, what was the phrase? It was like um, significant benefit in nitrous oxides in Birmingham from the clean air zone. You know, much debated in Birmingham and delayed, but I'd love to see more results like that where people are like, the air is cleaner, the roads are quieter, um, the roads are clearer, we're still getting around and, you know, able to go about our family or, or, or commercial business. Um, and, you know, that that's enabled by a bit of a shift into more sustainable transport. I like that answer. That's a very, very good answer. Thank you. Yeah. Well, let's see. I'll come back on in seven years' time, and you can say, Chris, you said this. Look, look at all the things that didn't happen. Or, oh, stop uh, it. No, no, we'll go. Look at all the things that direction. did happen. <laughs> come on. <laughs> right, so get in, get in. So, Senex, your, the website is senex, C E N E X dot co dot UK. Chris, yep. where do people find you if they actually want to have a chat with you specifically or your team? Yeah, I mean, um, we've got a contact form and, and the folks on the front desk are really good at putting it through to us. So just say, oh, I heard Chris wittering on about transport again and would like to talk about X. <laughs> um, I am on LinkedIn, so uh, look me up, Chris Rimmer. Um, and if you're coming, well, 
if you come uh, to LCV, our big event that happens in September, we probably will be after this goes out. So let's invite you to September 2024. We'd be delighted to have a coffee. Um, but we're in and around conferences and other things. So yeah, happy to, to chat and to discuss and yeah, to learn. There's a lot of good stuff going out there and going on out there and always interesting to hear what other people are up to. And everybody can sign up for your newsletter. So news and events is on your website. You've got a newsletter on there that goes out, haven't you? So, so yeah, there's there's lots of ways, and I can see you're you're also on Twitter. So, I, I mean, not you personally, but Senex are also on Twitter. So, yeah. just to say, thank you ever so much for joining me. It's been it's been an absolute delight talking to you. I think you're doing some fantastic things with, within the organisation. You and your teams just keep doing what you're doing, and and, ne and never think that you're not doing good things because you are. And it, you know, and and everybody's going to see that for what it is because of the effort you're putting in well uh it's very kind of you liz and thanks for your time and letting me on and uh yeah it's been a pleasure chatting thank you thank you brilliant well listen i'm going to say thank you to you i'm going to say goodbye to everybody else so until next time i'm going to say goodbye see you later bye you've been watching electric evolution with liz allen don't forget to subscribe and click on the bell icon and you'll receive all of our weekly videos. Thanks for watching. See you soon. Bye.